It's all yours, Ren. Go right ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, God bless you all in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. The topic tonight is Babylon's first siege of Jerusalem with Daniel's capture and how Daniel outlives the 70 years of Babylonian servitude. Uh, getting the chronology of this siege correct means a strict account of the years of Daniel's captivity leading up to Daniel's dream. Daniel's dream itself sets the tone and tenor for the period of Israel's history from Josiah's fall until the ministry of the Messiah and his confirmation of all God's promises to the patriarchs. Not only did Jeremiah's prophecy of 70 years have the silver lining of foretelling the return to Jerusalem, but Nebuchadnezzar's dream gives an exact countdown to Jesus Christ's victory over the world. Those who returned from the captivity knew exactly what to expect until Christ. But lo, do you see that fog bank up there just after Daniel's dream? That's the beginning of the Bermuda Triangle of biblical chronology. <laughs> we'll sell into it tonight, but if we ever get out of it, depends on next week's session. Anyway, uh, the first of the synchronisms the Bible sets up to get us through the Bermuda Triangle uh, involves Jeremiah's prophecy of the 70 years of servitude, uh, a prophecy that is almost unique in that this prophecy had a singular origin in time, in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, and that it had a designated period of time for its delivery until the destruction of the temple in Zedekiah 11. This we'll see in Jeremiah 1, 1 through 3. However, Jeremiah's prophecy is not absolutely unique, for Isaiah also gave forth prophecy that originated at a specific time during the outset of his ministry under Uzziah, Uzziah and which was then delivered over time until a specific, a specific ending date uh, in Isaiah 1, 8 through 9, which gives that year as Sennacherib's disgrace. In verses 8 and 9, it says, And the daughter of Zion, Jerusalem, is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant. We should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. If you remember Genesis 18, Abraham had bargained God down to sparing Sodom and Gomorrah if God could find ten righteous men. That's all the remnant needed to save Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham stopped bargaining at 10 because he figured, surely there's a 10 guys left in Sodom and Gomorrah. That ought to do it. Sodom and Gomorrah is saved, I'm sure. But did God find 10 righteous men? He did not. Uh, so according to uh, this standard, though, a very small remnant means a very small remnant. Uh, according to Isaiah's commissioning in Isaiah 16, 613a, this remnant was about 10%. Let me read it with you. I'm going to break this down. Uh, there's some really powerful Hebrew poetry here, but it's important to see the development of God's word concerning the remnant. But yet in it shall be a tenth, in it is the land. Yet in, yet in it a tenth, this tenth never left the land. It's the remnant, including Emmanuel, who went out from Jerusalem after Sennacherib was defeated. On the one hand, this is tragic. Just 10%? Is that all? Still, on the other hand, God moved heaven and earth for just 10%. What will he do for you who have the riches of the glory of the mystery, who have Christ in you? Even under Hezekiah, the nation as a whole had trouble getting back to God's word. Those of Jerusalem were the remnant of the nation. Judah lost about 90% of its inhabitants. The rest of Isaiah 6.13 is that challenging poetry. It is uh, it is different from 2 Kings 19.30-31, to 31, his description of this 10%. Here's that description from Kings. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant that shall escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. This analogy to Judah as a tree continues in Isaiah 6. God's words to Hezekiah, though, uh, concern the blessings on the remnant that would immediately follow upon Sennacherib's defeat. 
However, God's words to Isaiah in 613 about the same tree of the remnant included events that occur long after Hezekiah's last 15 years of rule. Here again is Isaiah 6, 613 that explains what will happen to the remnant and its posterity when they did become captive. First, Isaiah 613a again. Uh, but yet in it, in the land, shall be a tenth. Let me share the screen here. This is one I got. I have on the poster. How's it doing? It coming around? There it yep. goes. Yep. Yep. Okay. So you can see it from the King James Version. 613, but yet uh, in it shall be a tenth. So did this uh, group did not leave the land. And it shall return and shall be eaten. That's not totally wrong, but in this context, you're looking at it going, what? And as a teal tree, a teal tree is a uh, terebinth, according to Bollinger. And a terebinth is like a cashew tree. So the eat thing is not completely crazy. Uh, as a teal tree and as an oak, whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. And here it is from Young's the literal translation, and it hath turned. And return is the King James Version. Um, and they're right on that. If you look it up, the Cal uh, forms can be translated turn or returned. And hath been for a burning shall be for a spoil consumed, uh, according to the Septuagint, as a teal tree and as an oak that in falling have substance in them. The holy seed is its substance. E.W. Bollinger's companion notes, uh, and it, the tenth part, shall again be swept away. And as the terebinth and oak, whose life remains in them when felled, the holy seed will be the life thereof. So the combined essence goes like this. Uh, but yet in it, Judah shall be a tenth, and it, the tenth, the tree, shall return, and it shall have been taken for a spoil and consumed. But as with the terebinth and oak, whose life remains in them, felled the holy seed, uh, wait, see, when felled, the holy seed will be the life thereof. So a poetic emphasis might be something like this, but yet in it, the land, a tenth, and it, that tenth, to the land shall return, and it shall come to be for a spoil until it is consumed, as a terebinth, as completely as a cashew tree, and as a mighty oak is consumed or burned, because uh, the verb can go either way. So it's kind of like a pun, consumed or burned, only to be renewed from its holy root. So in that way, you can see that Isaiah is prophesying well into the future concerning the return from uh, Babylon and after all the things that those from Judah who take root downward and go upwards and lift up and, <laughs> and bear fruit upward shall go through. So you have the fruit from the uh, cashew tree and you have the holy root of the oak, which is um, the seed of the root of Jesse. Okay, so let's see. We've been through all of that, and that's what that's about. The holy seed is the root from Jesse, the righteous branch. God is promising Isaiah, even in his ministry of God's scattering, that the Christ line would not fail. Hence, while the prophecies of Isaiah would be age-enduring in their fulfillment, Isaiah's commissioning in Isaiah 6 was until just before the deliverance of Judah from the Assyrian threat of Sennacherib. Like Isaiah's prophecy, Jeremiah's prophecy of the 70 years of certitude had a date of origin. In Isaiah 6.1, the date of origin for Isaiah's prophecy is very specific. In the year that Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. In the year that Uzziah died, it's chron chronologically very specific. We can pin that date down exactly. Jeremiah's prophecy of 70 years also has a very specific date of origin, an origin especially important in that a specific duration of 70 years is given for this prophecy's fulfillment. Indeed, Jeremiah 26.1 and 27.1 date the origin of the 70-year prophecy in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim. That sounds a little squishy, 
but it's not as we shall see. In Jeremiah 1, 1 through 3, there are two dates of origin given for the prophecies of Jeremiah. And here it goes. Here's the 1, 1 through 3. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anaroth and in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. It, the word of God, came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive in the fifth month. The two dates of the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah are one, in the days of Josiah, in the 13th year, and two, in the days of Jehoiakim. Jeremiah's closing date for both prophecies is the 11th year of Zedekiah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem in the fifth month, just as Isaiah's role changed after the deliverance of, uh, of Jerusalem from Shennacherib, so Jeremiah's role changed after the desolation of Jerusalem uh, in the fifth month of Zedekiah 11. After Zedekiah 11, Jeremiah began to prophesy, prophesy to those in captivity of the return to Judah. He also prophesied to those left in the land. He also continued to prophesy to the nations round about Jerusalem. During those periods between the time of origin and the end of the prophet's commissioning, God reiterates his message in various ways, in various settings. However, the essence, the heart of the message, its warning, its guidance, is the same as when it was initially given by God's prophet. Jeremiah 1, 11 through 16, sets forth two visions of the first prophetic message Je Jeremiah was commissioned to deliver. Here it is, Jeremiah 1, 11 and 12. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a root of an almond tree. And then said the Lord unto me, thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. The almond tree represents early or timely guidance, for almond blossoms are the first blossoms of spring. This vision is also God's encouragement to Jeremiah to have no fear. Jeremiah was a Levite, and the miraculous blossoming of Aaron's almond rod was God's divine sign that he had chosen the tribe of Levi to serve him. That's in Numbers 17. Likewise, Jeremiah could be certain that he too was chosen to serve uh, God's word, and that, like the blossoming of Aaron's rod, God would bring his word to pass with miraculous swiftness. Jeremiah 1, 13 through 16, reveals the second vision pertaining to Jeremiah's first commissioning to speak for God. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? Notice the second time. And I said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. And the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof around about, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me, and have burnt incense to other gods, and worshipped the works of their own hands. The second image of the cauldron of the north is a prophetic message of the consequences to Israel if Judah would not return to God. The message was delivered throughout the rule of Josiah, for Josiah's defibrillator, can I say this? Blah, blah, blah. Josiah's defibrillator of a Passover had a sustained effect only on a remnant of Judah. The full specifics of God's impending wrath would not be given to Jeremiah until the days of Jehoiakim and Nebuchadnezzar. Interestingly, Jeremiah's first message given in the days of Josiah does not speak of the 70 years of servitude or the carrying away of Jerusalem. It looks like because of Manasseh's unbelief, the siege was established. However, by God's mercy and grace, the carrying away and the desolation was still possible to avoid. Until Jehoiakim's rebellion, avoiding the carrying away and the captivity of the second and third sieges would have been possible if Judah had obeyed Jeremiah's words. In 2 Kings 24, 1-3, are some of the events of Jehoiakim's reign, who was the first of the puppet kings of Judah. 
In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jehoiakim became his servant three years, and he turned and rebelled against him. This is during the second commissioning of Jeremiah, in which he is specifically telling Jehoiakim to submit to Nebuchadnezzar and not rebel. And the Lord sent against him bands of Chaldeans and bands of Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the children of Ammon and sent unto them and sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets. Nebuchadnezzar had not even gotten there yet, and Judah was in ruins. Here's uh, 24, verse 3. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did. The sin of Manasseh was mentioned in Josiah's time and now again in Jehoiakim's. Verse 4. And also for the innocent blood that he, Manasseh, shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. It is important to know that there was no third commissioning in which the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in the days of Zedekiah. Certainly God's word does, by revelation, come to Jeremiah in those days, but these are simply restatements and applications of the word Jeremiah initially was called to speak in the first days of Jehoiakim. So again, there are two distinct periods in which the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. The one in the days of Josiah established the first siege of Jerusalem by those from the cauldron of the north, and the second, given in the days of Jehoiakim, involved the 70 years of servitude to Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible is very capable of saying in the first year or in the second year of a king's reign, and this it does often. However, what Hebrew phrase does the Bible use to name, specifically, the accession year of a new monarch? Usually the biblical phrase that means the very instant the king sat on the throne is began to rule. Beyond naming the first instant a king sat on the throne, an instant that may or may not have been part of the king's accession year, how then does the Bible signify the accession year of a new monarch that has not yet reached his first regnal year? The Bible uses a very specific phrase. It's translated in the first of the reign. Or actually, I guess that's, yeah, that's the translation. Usually it gets translated in a really wishy-washy fashion where it says in the beginning of his reign. But the first of his reign is the precise phrase, and it's used consistently to show the accession year of a king. Hence, Jeremiah 27.1 is very chronologically uh, specific. In the beginning, the first of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word unto Jeremiah from the Lord. When I saw this phrase, first of his reign, and triple-checked it, that's when I knew that Carl Johnson's idea from the Gentile times reconsidered that the prophecy of the 70 years began in 609 BC was indeed correct. The first of Jehoiakim's reign means the last year of Josiah's rule, the year in which he was killed by Pharaoh Necho in battle and buried. It also indicates the year in which his son Jehoahaz reigned for three months. And it shows the year in which after Tevet, the 10th month, but before Nisan of Jehoiakim's accession year, Jehoiakim began to rule. Therefore, according to Jeremiah 27.1, the beginning of Jehoiakim's rule was sometime after Tevet of Josiah 31 in 609, and the count of 70 years, or thinking like a Hebrew, the count of 70 Nisans would have begun in the Nisan of Josiah 31. However, we enter a pickle as biblical chronologists. For Nebuchadnezzar 37 is the end of the Bible's strict chronology of the history of his people. There are no more ages given to the patriarchs, nor years attributed to the judges complete with periods between them. There are no more rec records of the secession of the Hebrew kings. In this period between the fall of Jerusalem and the coming of the Messiah, there are very scant descriptions of the kings and empires that impacted and came in contact with God's people in their captivity and return. Though it is implied, the Bible doesn't, e doesn't even explicitly state the last year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. That's why we can only see the fulfillment of Jer Jeremiah 27.1 once we plug in the eclipse guaranteed secular historians. I know, gross, depending on the world, ooh. However, this secular history is signed off on as okay by the Bible in that there are at least five different synchronisms between the Bible and the eclipse-verified secular history. 
Meanwhile, during Jehoiakim's entire reign, Jeremiah was foretelling of the 70 years of servitude to Nebuchadnezzar. But Jehoiakim's reign began as Pharaoh Necho's puppet, as it explains in 2 Kings 23, 31 through 34. In 31, it says, Jehoahaz was 20 and three years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. And Pharaoh Necho put him in bands at Ribla in the land of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem, and put the land to a tribute of an hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And Pharaoh Necho, Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the room of Josiah, his father, and turned his name to Jehoiakim. Jeremiah's prophecy is one which foretold to Judah in the lands round about Judah, submit to Nebuchadnezzar peaceably or suffer the consequences. That's the Manetti summary, but that's the idea. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is now the boss. If you don't obey him, you will get enslaved. And that was not just to Judah, that was to all the lands. The first four regnal years of Zedekiah show e uh, Egypt's resistance to Nebuchadnezzar and their consequences in a painful defeat. Egypt was the first worldwide confirmation of Jeremiah's prophecy of 70 years of servitude to Babylon. Just as Judah became more and more enslaved as it rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, so also, if you check Ezekiel 29, 17 through 19, you can see that Egypt and Judah's neighbor, Tyrus, also fell into greater and greater, greater bondage as they too rebelled against Babylon. The first siege of Jerusalem was foretold as a certainty in the days of Josiah and fulfilled Isaiah's final recorded prophecy to Hezekiah that we had last session. There are a variety of terms and definitions for the level of subservience uh, Judah had to the empires around it, but generally in Ahaz's days, Judah was a tributary state to Assyria. Against this subservience, Hezekiah rebelled. However, once an empire like Egypt appointed the king for Judah, Judah became in greater bondage than it was as a tributary state. Instead of taxes, uh, instead of the taxes of Judah going to the king and the king paying it from his own treasury, 2 Kings 23, 35 shows how Jehoiakim now did as Pharaoh Necho commanded. And Jehoiakim gave the silver and gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give the money according to the commandment of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and gold of the people of the land of every one according to his taxation to give it to Pharaoh Necho. Some might say that Judah was now a client state of Egypt. After Judah's return from the Babylonian captivity, it will have returned to something more akin to a tributary state. There would be a governor, not a king, and a high priest. However, both positions would be according to Judah's own will. Nevertheless, Judah would still be part of the administrative state of the Persian Empire. The age of kings will have passed until Shiloh's coming. However, during the reign of Jehoiakim, things went only from bad to worse. For instance, the first thing Nebuchadnezzar does when he is named the crown prince of Babylon is to go straight for the Hebrew gold. Was Nebuchadnezzar carrying the list uh, that the envoys of Merodach Baladan had made of Hezekiah's treasures? The Bible doesn't say. And this is an entirely different Babylonian dynasty. Still, uh, from the ancient archives of the Babylonians, we get many star charts. So who knows, maybe a single report of the treasures of Ju uh, Jerusalem found the light of day. But Judah was also the next nation state in the southerly expansion of the Babylonian empire. To understand this first siege of Jerusalem, there are two records of Jehoiakim's relationship to Nebuchadnezzar, which must be read carefully. The first is in 2 Kings 24.1. In his, Josiah's days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. And the second is uh, in 2 Chronicles 36, verses 5 and 6. Uh, Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. And against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in fetters and carried him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar also carried the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. That's verse 7. 
The difference in the two records can be hard to see at first. In the first record, Jehoiakim became Nebuchadnezzar's servant. In the second, he became Nebuchadnezzar's prisoner. The first record is about the first siege of Babylon, and the second record in 2 Chronicles is about that second siege. The first siege fulfilled the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah in the days of Josiah. Jeremiah's ministry that began in the first of Jehoiakim was to deliver God's word so that the second siege need not occur. By way of review, then, in Josiah, Pharaoh, oh, in Josiah 31, Pharaoh, Pharaoh Necho killed Josiah in battle at Medigo. Josiah's son then ruled for three months. Pharaoh Necho then appointed Jehoiakim king. Pharaoh Necho lost a key battle to Nebuchadnezzar's father at Haran, and Jeremiah received the word of the Lord. Then in a second battle in 605, Egypt again advances past Judah, heading to the Euphrates, and loses a great battle at Cargamish to Nebuchadnezzar. One of the flames that kindled this conflagration at the Euphrates was Nebuchadnezzar's first siege of Jerusalem. Daniel 1, 1 through 4 gives the details. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of, the, of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. <laughs> and the king spake to Asphenes, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel to the, of the, and of the king's seed and of the princes. King's seed, that's the Christ line. That's Hezekiah's kid, kids, posterity, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. In the first siege, as described by Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar on, took only part of the vessels of the Lord. In the second siege, described by 2 Chronicles, the vessels of the house of the Lord, without any exception, were taken to Babylon. These vessels will show up in ironic glory at the fall of Babylon under Belshazzar's watch. The process of the 70 years of servitude leading to desolation can also be seen in Daniel. Daniel 1.1 shows Judah had already begun to serve King Nebuchadnezzar in Jehoiakim 3 when Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem and carried away captives, princes of the royal line of the seed of David. Although this is part of the process of the 70 years of servitude, it fulfills in a moment of time Isaiah's final prophecy to Hezekiah, final recorded prophecy to Hezekiah in 2 Kings 20, verse 18, where it says, and of thy sons that issue from thee, wilt thou, that, uh, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Many believe that Daniel 1.1 1, 1 must actually be in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, not his third. Some have reconciled these dates in their thinking by supposing that Daniel's Jehoiakim 3 was really Judah's Jehoiakim 4, according to Hebrew reckoning. This is possible technically, but it does not fit at all with two of the other timekeepers or synchronisms from the Bible. One of those is Daniel's three years of preparation before he could stand before Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, if Daniel was using Babylonian reckoning, he would have counted Jehoiakim 3 as beginning in Nisan and Jehoiakim 4 as ending in Nisan. Then if Nebuchadnezzar had invaded Tishri, uh, after Tishri of the Hebrew reckoning of Jehoiakim 4, Jehoiakim 4 still would have been Nebuchadnezzar 1. Daniel would have been carried away captive in Jehoiakim 4 in Hebrew reckoning, but in Jehoiakim 3 in Babylonian reckoning. There are no other examples of Daniel speaking of the reigns of the Hebrew kings, so technically this is a biblical possibility. I'm giving the critics the benefit of the doubt here. Nevertheless, the chronology given below that counts Daniel's captivity from Jehoiakim 3 fits more precisely with Daniel 1.5, which reads, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, in Western thinking, three Nisans. 
uh, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. And then Daniel 1, 18, that says, now at the end of the days that the king had said he should choose, he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And finally, Daniel 2, 1 says, and in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, whereof his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. So how does Nebuchadnezzar dream this dream in his second year, but prepare Daniel to stand before him for three years? That's a tricky calculation, which becomes impossible if one thinks Jehoiakim three is Jehoiakim four. Nebuchadnezzar is named crown prince after Nisan of Jehoiakim three. So biblically, he ascended in Jehoiakim three, but his first year of co-regency is postdated to Nisan of Jehoiakim four. All of the biblical records of Nebuchadnezzar indicate a co-regency of one year with his father, Nabopolassar. Uh, more on this next session. Uh, when we do the Bible nexus between uh, the Hebrew calendar and the Roman Gregorian solar calendar. So let me share this screen one more time. Where'd it go? It's hiding from here. It is. Yeah, all that it's a little hard. It should be easier to see it here. The synchronisms of Daniel's training and Nebuchadnezzar's dream of his second year. This doesn't include the critics' confused ideas about two reckonings. In, in general, absolutely every single time, the king who God is discussing is discussed according to that king's own royal calendar, whether it's a Roman emperor, whether it is a king of the of Judah, whether it's a king of the north, whether it's a king of Babylon, that person's royal calendar is the one in use. So that Daniel would probably would be using, logically, he would be using the Judean calendar uh, because we're talking about a Judean king or Nebuchadnezzar's calendar when you're talking about Nebuchadnezzar. And that's what this kind of reflects. Uh, Daniel is taken, Daniel taken captive, Nebuchadnezzar named prince. Nebuchadnezzar ascends and goes right after the gold. Uh, the next year is Cargamesh. The Egyptians didn't take kindly to Nebuchadnezzar stealing their uh, yearly tribute. So in order to respond, they went forward and they lost the battle at Cargamesh, thus proving for the whole world to see uh, for the first time that J Jeremiah's prophecy was true. Uh, then Daniel preparation year one, as soon as he's captured, that first Nisan counts as the first Nisan of his preparation. Then Jehoiakim's payment for the second year of servitude assumed because he's going to serve for three years. Uh, Jeremiah's uh, fourth, uh, Jeremiah's year four declaration is ignored. Jeremiah prepares the scroll. Uh, Jeremiah 36, one through two is where he does that. Then in Jehoiakim 5, that's Daniel's second year of preparation, and it's the first sole rule of Nebuchadnezzar. It's his second year of co-regency. And Jehoiakim's payments for the third year of servitude. Jehoiakim cuts up Jeremiah's <laughs> scroll. He decides to rebel. And then it's the first year of the rebellion is Jehoiakim 6. And this is Daniel's preparation year three. After that Nisan, he's av available to go interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Nebuchadnezzar's second soul year of reign. So that's how that timetable works. And it keeps the confusion of trying to figure two different chronologies and getting them upside down and backwards. A lot of the historians do that because they're not, well, they've got a different take on the secular histories than the Bible. Okay, so we saw <clears throat> all these things. Uh, ah, Daniel stands before Nebuchadnezzar and interprets his dream of the empires that would arise before the coming of Christ. The irony is that in this year, in two different kingdoms, with two different kings and two different prophets, one believes God and one rejects his word. Sadly, it is Nebuchadnezzar, the Gentile king who believed, and the Hebrew king who rejected God and his word. So let's look at this dream. Uh, I'm going to be in Daniel chapter 2. It's like one through forever. So if you want to join me there, I'll be there for a little while. Uh, Daniel 2, verse 1. 
And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac. Much of Daniel is written in Aramaic, a.k.a. Syriac, the language of the Babylonians that Daniel learned in his three years of preparation. O king, live forever, they said. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. And the king answered to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Dunghill. I'm not going to give you a New York City translation of that. You have to look it up. <laughs> but even, even so, the theme here is how to keep your cool under pressure. Can you imagine the intensity, the confusion and fear that spread among the wise men of Babylon? If Daniel had not had great peace with God, he could not have received God's word, the word that would save his life. But Daniel maintained his composure. He had the guts to go to God and not be carried away with the panic and fear. He maintained God's peace and presence in his life, despite all hell breaking loose in the senses realm. Daniel 2, verse 10. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, no lord, no ruler that asks such things of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requires. There is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Surely all this was true, uh, but this is only Nebuchadnezzar's second year of soul rule. He couldn't let a bunch of swaggering magicians embarrass him like that. So for a bunch of wise men, not very wise. It was not a word fitly spoken, and it certainly didn't help. Verse 12, watch this thing. For this cause, the king was angry and very furious, ruh -roh, and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Apparently, it was the Chaldeans that infuriated Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel wasn't there, but was among the magicians or magi. Proverbs 51 says, A soft answer driveth away wrath. Death was at Daniel's door, but Daniel knew God's word and applied it. Then Daniel says in verse 14, Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. And he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? That Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Sounds like Daniel went in by himself. Throughout all the rage and all the rest of it, there's no group with him. Just Daniel and Arioch went in. Pretty intense. And Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, though, wanted answers more than blood. So he relented. At least a little. Verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, uh, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. These are the Hebrew names for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a fiery furnace fame. Uh, that they would desire the mercies of God, in verse 18, um, they went together, that they would desire the mercies of God of, of the God of heaven concerning the secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the men, wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. He must have had until at least the morning, but the pressure was still on. The time couldn't have been much more than that. Daniel 2, 24. Therefore, Daniel went into went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he went and said thus unto them, destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Wow, even those crazy Chaldeans get in on Daniel and God's grace. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. And Arioch brought Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of, Ju of Judah, that will make known unto the king the interpretation. See that it says in haste. King Nebuchadnezzar was not sitting on his throne room, sitting in his throne room all night to hear from Daniel. But by the time Daniel gains access, the time was just up or had just passed. 
while sharpening his axe and putting on his execution mask, here's the dream and in Daniel's interpretation. Daniel 2, we're in 30, verse 31 to 38. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. We would say awesome. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, and his belly and his thighs of brass, and his legs of iron, and his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven hath he given unto thy hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. It's the word, but isn't God wise? God called Nebuchadnezzar the head of gold. You can almost see Nebuchadnezzar putting down his ax and setting aside his execution mask. The crazed lion is purring now. Surely Nebuchadnezzar was thinking, Tell me more, Daniel. Tell me more. Verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. We know from history that the second kingdom, that of silver, is the kingdom of the Persians and the Medes. It's flattering, of course, but spiritually, Babylon gets the gold, for Nebuchadnezzar will actually write part of the Bible, and his dreams interpretation will become guidance for God's people. The Persians get the silver because Cyrus will carry out God's word and command the rebuilding of the temple. The third kingdom, history tells, of, tells us of, is Greece, the kingdom of brass. Oh, by the way, are th these the only empires in the world at that time? No, but this is the sequence of kingdoms under which Judah would be a tributary state or client state until Jesus Christ is born and lives and carries out his mission. Daniel 2.40 and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. As iron that breaketh all these, it shall it break in pieces and bruise. Interesting, break in pieces and bruise. The bruising, I just wonder. It's Messiah is bruised under the hand of the Romans. Uh, this fourth kingdom is, of course, Rome. With this, all Israel should know exactly the timeline until Christ. And this dream came to the Gentile king. Why couldn't it have come to Jehoiakim? Because Jehoiakim did not believe. Now because the church age, now because the church age, the age that began on Pentecost, was hidden in God. Look how close the return of Christ and the millennial kingdom is to the birth of Christ and the Roman Empire. Verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of iron, insomuch as the as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with clay, they, the kings, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay." Kings might not be right. They may refer to something else. Verse 44, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made note unto the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. The millennial kingdom and the wrath of the breaking of the statue is the very next item in Daniel's dream. All the other kingdoms leading up to this feat of iron are a couple of centuries maximum. So the toes, that's even a smaller part of the statue. The purpose of the ages had come and fulfilled all that was written of him. 
Why tarry any longer? From the perspective of Israel and Abraham and the law, it was finished. Why wait? The millennial kingdom is the very next thing. Now the Lord Jesus Christ knew that there was an entire age that had nothing to do with the law that was yet to be fulfilled. John the Baptist knew of it. That's why on one hand, the apostles asked in Acts 1.6, uh, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou this time restore the kingdom to Israel? That's the very next thing on Daniel's list. That's what's next according to the law. Good thing for us, there's grace. The Lord Jesus Christ responded in Acts 1.7, and he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Not even the Lord knew that this period of grace would go on for thousands of years and that millions and millions of people would believe and get born again. But he said in verse 8, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That's the coming of the Comforter and the baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Biblically, the kingdom of iron ended with the fulfillment of the law at Calvary with Pilate. Back to Nebuchadnezzar. See God's great wisdom? Nebuchadnezzar was so pleased to be the golden king and to be better than all the kingdoms that he didn't notice the scary part about getting bashed uh, by the rock. That last part must have been what woke Nebuchadnezzar up in the middle of the night. So who is the stone or the rock? Sure, Jesus Christ, who is the mountain, the almighty God. The rock Christ Jesus is God's only begotten son is made of the same stuff as the mountain. Psalm 118, 22 and 23. The stone which the builders refused has become the head stone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This, the rock that knocks down the big statue that woke Nebuchadnezzar up with night chills, the wrath and the millennial period of paradise administration are both made known. Any wise man following the revelation would have known that Rome was the fourth empire. No wonder the ancient world was abuzz with prophecies of the Messiah when he was born in a manger hundreds of years later. However, as I mentioned, with Nebuchadnezzar's 37th and last year, we have no more strictly biblical chronological records. However, besides the synchronism of Jeremiah's start date for his prophecy of the 70 years, the Bible prov prov provides a second synchronism through the secular history of the Ptolemy's king list can be verified. Here it is in Jeremiah 26, 6 through 7. And now have I, the Lord God of hosts, given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And the beasts of the field have I given unto him also to serve him. <clears throat> and all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until the very time of the land, his land has come. When the 70 years will have expired, then it'll be Nebuchadnezzar's turn. And when that happens, many nations, it says, and great kings shall serve themselves of him. The end date of the period of the Babylonian servitude for Judah and all nations round about is given as three generations. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's generation, his son, uh, evil Merodach from 2 Kings 25, and as we'll see, Belshazzar of Daniel's days. Belshazzar's reign is certainly a co-regency of some kind. For Daniel 529, in Daniel 529, Belshazzar has only enough authority uh, to make Daniel third in the kingdom. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, and put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him, that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Unlike Pharaoh, who, as he placed his golden chain around Joseph's neck, and made Joseph second in the kingdom after himself, here, Belshazzar's golden chain can only make Daniel third in the kingdom. This is because Belshazzar himself is second in the kingdom, not first. Nevertheless, the name of the senior regent is not in the Bible, though it does seem to be in Ptolemy's king's list. Instead of specifying 70 years, Jeremiah proclaims three generations of Babylonian ascendancy. The king of the last generation before Cyrus, the grandson's generation, is set in Ptolemy's king's list as Belshazzar. No, Nabon, Nabon Itis who is not of Nebuchadnezzar's blood. Neither was Neraglasser, the third historic king of Babylon. 
However, the Bible focuses on Belshazzar, who is of the matriarchal line of Nebuchadnezzar, of the third generation. He's the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy, who, according to Daniel in Daniel 5.18, was of the line of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel, in Daniel it says, O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. Likewise, Daniel 5.22 attests that Belshazzar was the seed and posterity of Nebuchadnezzar. And thou, his son, O Belsh Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. That Belshazzar is the third of the third generation is expressed in what, again, to Western thinking, is a mysterious series of verses. Daniel 5.10-12. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let, thy thoughts, let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of thy father light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father, the king, I say thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit in knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let, the, now let Daniel be called, and he shall show the interpretation. Doesn't she seem too aged and regal to be Belshazzar's literal queen? How does the queen know every detail about Belteshazzar when Belshazzar has never even heard of him? By faith, we know that there are figures of speech present in this section concerning the words father and mother. We know we are on the third generation because we've met the first generation in Jeremiah 52, 31. And in Jeremiah 27's prophecy, uh, he de Jeremiah declared three generations. Moreover, we know that this last king of Babylon recorded in the Bible before Cyrus. We always take the Bible literally and at face value unless the Bible itself requires that we apply our understanding of figures of speech. Here, the Bible overwhelmingly does just that. There are two idioms or figures of speech that have already appeared in the chronology of the kings of Israel and Judah. The first, is, uh, first that is here is uh, queen, which means queen mother. She may have been either Belshazzar's literal mother or his grandmother. Secondly here, father indicates lineage and instruction rather than literal father. These two idioms with father and mother occurred in 1 Kings 15, 9 through 11. Here, here they are. They appear in perfect balance. And in the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa over Judah. And 40 and one years reigned he in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Makkah, the daughter of Absalom. Absalom. And 40 and one years reigned he in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Makkah, the daughter of Absalom. Did I do that twice? I did. And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David, his father. So you've got his mother's name, and you got David, his father. So the same idiom used in perfect balance. The Bible, as shown above, makes no secret. Belshazzar was a co-regent with a senior king the Bible does not name. Nevertheless, it is the grandson's reign, his pride, and his sin that brought Babylon down in a single night. In this way, Jeremiah's 20, Jeremiah 27's prophecy is fulfilled according to the three generations of kings and forms a second synchronism verifying the famous Ptolemy's kings list. A record of Belshazzar, the son of Nabonidus, is found in the cylinders of Nabonidus. However, based on the cylinders of Nabonidus, Nabonidus was the senior regent but had retired to Tima, leaving the rule of Babylon to Belshazzar. In, number of the, uh, in a number of the Bible's record of, of co-regencies, such as Ahab and Basha, the junior regent, Ahab, is scarcely mentioned until he accedes. However, in other co-regencies, such as Ahaz and Solomon's, the senior regent has become so inconsequential that only the junior regent is named thereafter. Hence, the absence, of the absence of the senior king's name in the biblical record of Belshazzar's reign may indicate that the dominant region was Belshazzar. That's all for this session. We've covered the first of the three sieges of Jerusalem and Daniel's capture by Nebuchadnezzar. 
We've also entered the Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle of biblical chronology. Only by following the father's maps of the synchronism, synchronisms with Ptolemy's king list, focusing on the star-studded eclipse verified secular history, can we find solid ground in the next session. God bless you. You are the best. <laughs>